Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our study here with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for this morning. We have been grateful for all of the, the light that has been, been given us so far this week and even before. And we're thankful that we can study together, that we can learn from one another, and that your Holy Spirit can be present as we are gathered together to search out your word for the precious truths that have been hidden in it. And we pray, Lord, for each person. We pray for this movement. We pray for those that are grieving. We pray for those that are struggling. We pray for those that have health issues. And we also ask, Lord, that you can give us wisdom and understanding that these things that we learn, um, that we will be able to act them out, that they will change us in our character and in our behavior. And so we need your help, Lord, as we open your word together. Be in our midst, guide and direct, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again, and um, I have my Bible open here because I was working on that paper dealing with the manna, which uh, I'm finding out interesting things, but we need to go to Judges, and we were, we were addressing and contemplating the signs of the fleas, so that's what we were we're addressing yesterday when we finished our study. Now, uh, the question then, just to jump into it, we have to decide what the fleece represents and what the ground represents. Um, we know that the dew and the water represents the Holy Spirit. So that is the thing that is needed in this sign. Do we have God leading us um, in what we are are given to do, right? So we know that there was the first sign of the offering. <clears throat> but now he's going to have these two other signs. And we're taking that Gideon doesn't represent a person. Particularly, he represents a message. So secondarily, those that are giving that message are attached to the symbol of Gideon. And remember that this sign of the fleece is going to occur before we have the division of the 300. So normally we would look at this um, chronologically, that these things follow one after the other. Um, but I'm arguing that um, this sign of the fleece is not something that occurs before the division of the 300. But I could be wrong, right? So um, as we look at this and examine it, maybe there's something that we're going to find that... Um, could change my mind, would make me see things a little differently. <clears throat> so um, the first thing, when we look at this word fleece, um, this comes from a root, a means to cut off, specifically to shear a flock, to shave the hair, figuratively to destroy an enemy, cut off or down, pull, that is to cut the hair, shave. Um, <clears throat> so does that give us some insight into what this fleece represents as a symbol? So if we're having this fleece as a symbol that's being set out, it's something that's cut off or represents something that's cut off. <clears throat> yeah, wool that has been cut off, right? So, um, but the idea of fleece is that it doesn't refer to wool. It refers to something that's been cut off. In this case, wool, but it can refer to other things.
So is there any significance in the idea that it's something that's cut off? Well, wouldn't that, in, in being cut off, it's something that is removed it's something that is separated right so it would refer to a, a separation of some sort right okay now it's the only place that this is used in the bible in this way this word so it's just in in judges chapter 6 verse 37 to 40 that we find the word fleece um this word fleece gaza now, it um, comes from another word, right? So the word that it comes from is the word, um, uh, the 1494. And that word <clears throat> means to shear, mow, etc. cetera. Um, and so that word does show up. Um, so the difference has to do with the dotting. So uh, that's the only difference here. But that one is used in Genesis when they shear the sheep, shearers, sheep shears. Uh, so it's used other places. Uh, but you can see there it's not translated as fleece in any in that other use. So here it's just something that is cut off, something that is sheared, right? All right. So now, of course, we have the earth, right? So we know aritz, that's the Hebrew word for land or earth or ground. Um, so this thing that's cut off is going to be put up on the earth. And the test is going to be to see whether uh, the fleece. This is going to be wet while the ground or the earth is dry. That's the first test. So the Holy Spirit, if, if we're going to take the Holy Spirit, he says that it's going to be upon those that, upon that that is cut off, right? The fleece. But the earth is not going to have this dew. So how would we take this symbol as a test? Where would we place this? Is there anything that parallels this? Is there anything prophetically that parallels this? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anything in our history, anything that we could, that we can take from this. I mean, we have this pretty straightforward uh, test that he does, but it has these symbols. Now, the, the so we have the dew and we also have the dry. So the dry is drought or desolation, right? Horeb. So if the earth is dry and the fleece has dew, the fleece represents something that's cut off what is it representing? And what is the dryness of the earth representing? If we place this where the Holy Spirit is representative of the dew, and the earth then is not able to receive the Holy Spirit. Is that representative <clears throat> of the time prior to the latter rain? Okay, so... So you're talking about the former rain. Right. Okay. Because you got former and latter, but I mean prior to that of the latter rain, because 
the earth is not receiving the Holy Spirit in the time of the former or the latter rain. Yeah. And, and when we look at wool, yeah, so I'll come back to that. So when we look at wool, it means <clears throat> metaphorically, and also wool in garments, right? So wool in garments. Um, and it says it's probably from an unused root that means to be shaggy, but originally. Um, <clears throat> but here we have, have this fleece of the wool that's cut off from the wool, right? That's literally how we would translate this. And he puts it on the floor, um, uh, which is just the, the flat threshing floor, the smooth area. And, and and he's asking if the dew be on the fleece only, that is this that is cut off, and it be dry upon the earth, then I shall know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. So if we're gonna look at this as as a test, I mean Is this a reference to then the the former rain? It could be. Okay, so that's one idea. <clears throat> now, when he rose up early on the morrow, he thrust the fleece together and wring the dew of the fleece, out of the fleece, and a bowl full of water. So we have this, um, this process. He rises up early, and he takes all the fleece, puts it all together, wrings it out, and he has this bowl, bowl full of water. And there's this reference maybe to the laver or something like that. But we would see that, I mean, that would, in some ways, that symbol could work. Um, but this would refer to um, to what? What would this? What could this possibly mean? What does a bowl represent? Well, um, well, it's. I mean, it's it's some kind of container. It's a basin. It's a laver. Um, there isn't really a lot here with this. I mean, we look at some of the different verses that use this word bowl. And I'm waiting for my computer here to show. But there, there really is only used in judges. So, so we can't really look at this word somewhere else. We can look at other types of vessels, right? <clears throat> You know, we, we know there's the pot and there's the, the pan and there's um, the laver, etc. But here it's, it's only used in judges, this word. Judges 5 and 6. It means to depress. Um, And the other place it's used is Judges 5.25. So I'm just going to go there. <clears throat> he asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish, right? So this is going to be de dealing with uh, uh, Sisera, right? Okay, so you're, you're saying that the Hebrew word itself only occurs... In judges. In judges. Mm -hmm. Yet <clears throat> in Numbers 785, we also would have a bowl referenced in the English, but is that a, a different Hebrew word? Yeah. Um, yeah, completely different word. Mitzrach, what rather than Sephel. 
and in Ecclesiastes 12.6. Um, yeah. Again, another word, gula. So they have lots of different names for different types of vessels in Hebrew. Okay. Right. <clears throat> the was... one that we have in Judges is Judges 525. And the significance there is the symbol of 525. <clears throat> that division of the 777 with 252. Um, but it's also dealing with um, some other symbols there. Butter. Um, and milk. Um, you know, butter and honey may he eat, and, and also um, milk, the sincere milk of the word. All right, so we have here a reference to God's word, to the studying of God's word, and to to um, uh, affliction as well when you take that. So, <clears throat> so we have that with the word dish. Okay, or bull, I mean, the word bull, but it's translated as dish in Judges 5.25. Same word. <clears throat> so would this be a test that something is drawn from God's word um, that produces the Holy Spirit? And how would that be a test? How would we see that manifest? <clears throat> okay, when, when is the former reign in our history? Wouldn't that be September 11, 2001? Well, that would be the latter rain. That's the beginning for the latter rain, yes. But, I mean, is that also not possible to be the former rain? No. Okay. Because no, the former rain comes first. They don't come. All right. But the, the full outpouring is going to come after the Sunday mm -hmm. law, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the latter rain period is with the Sunday law. But remember, we have 9-11 as marking the beginning of the Sunday law in our line. That is, our line is the beginning of the Sunday law in the big line. So, so we can't put the former rain at 9-11. At it has to be before. Now, of course, there is the former rain there, you know, because when you have the former rain, um, uh, the verse that's often used, it was the one that uh, Brother Caldwell used in that uh, message he sent to Ellen White that we had studied on, on in the study on righteousness by faith. Um, and this is going to be so we can find this quicker. So this is Joel two twenty three. <clears throat> be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the former rain moderately. He will cause down, he will cause to come down for you the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. 
Now, this is generally interpreted as that the former rain and the latter rain both come in the first month. That's how Brother Caldwell interpreted it. Right? So he was trying to use that in regard to the World's Fair in Chicago. Right. But um, the latter rain comes to ripen the grain. Right. right. The right. former rain is when the grain is, is planted, which you do in the fall, and then you get your rains, you know, through December into January. Um, and then you're going to have the latter rain come down, and that's going to help ripen the grain um, to fill it out and, and, and bring it to fruition, right? So that then you can harvest it. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings that have come about um, dealing with the care rites and how, how the Feast of First Fruits occurs. So that's something that I'm working on. And you don't have all of the grain ready to be harvested uh, at the beginning of first fruits. You only have the first ripe ears and they're gonna be harvesting that grain um, first first the barley and then the wheat um, for another seven weeks, right? Okay. Yeah, and uh, the grain back then was not as consistent as grains are today. That is, um, and even today, you can go from one field to the next and you can find differences of when something is ready uh, to harvest. Um, especially if you have hilly fields, you're going to find that uh, place, some places the, the grain is not as ripe as it is in other places. Um, so how much sun they get, what type of soil they have, how much water they have are all going to affect the different grain. And, and, and especially at that time, they didn't have the, the hybridized grains that we have. So you would you plant your crop, you would have to wait pretty much till everything's ready because you can't really just go through and pick what's ripe and what's not. Um, so anyway, the point is, when it comes to the latter rain, it comes in the first month. So it's something that's coming at the beginning of the year uh, to help in the harvest, right? So you're not gonna begin until the 16th to even begin. So that latter rain would be occurring at the beginning of the month through the time of, of uh, and, and, and how much rain it is, it's not a great deal of rain. It's not as much rain as you would have in December and January. But it does happen, right? <clears throat> now, so the former rain is, is, occurs with the fall or the winter and the latter rain with the spring. I remember reading um, an article by an evangelist back in 1984. And, and he had got this mixed up. He thought that the former rain was in the spring and the latter rain in the fall. And he put those together with, you know, the former rain happened with the spring types and the latter rain with the fall types, which isn't the case. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's a common misconception that people have. They just think that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but here, here we're dealing with this idea that the former rain happens in the fall and in, in the winter and the latter rain in the spring. Now, how would we relate that then to understanding the former and the latter rain that's talked about in the book of Joel? Because we know the former rain would have been in the time of Christ, Pentecost, and the latter rain would be in um, somewhere connected with our time, right? If we're looking on, on a bigger perspective. Correct. Okay. 
But we do know in a repeat of history, we also need the former rain and the latter rain. Now, um, Parminder, and I hate to bring him up, but in, in this case, he had used a model and his was the agricultural model in which he tried to argue um, that you have this period in which uh, the plowing occurs and then you're gonna have the seed planted and then you're gonna have the former rain um, and then you're gonna have the latter rain and then you have the harvest. And uh, the thing that was sort of odd about what Parminder was doing is he had attacked uh, Chawatu um, who had been using the Psalm 23 model for the lines because it destroyed 9-11, right? So, so Parminder opposed it because he believed that Chawatu's view of Psalm 23 destroyed our lines and destroyed 9-11. Uh, but Parminder went about to do the same thing with his agricultural model, and actually in a much worse way than what mm -hmm. Chawatu did. I agreed. Okay. So we take the position that the former rain happens prior to 9-11. Now, in his model, he just had the plowing happens, right? And then you're going to have the seed planted, right? And then it's going to grow and all these types of things. And, and those, those models are fine, but they don't, he didn't fit them on the line correctly because he was mixing lines together. And I don't want to really go through his whole argument, but in in what he was doing, he was taking something that happens that's a harvest that happens after the close of probation for the world and ignoring that there is a harvest that occurs in our lines as well. Right, because we do have a harvest that happens before the close of probation. I mean, sure, the final harvest of both the wicked and the righteous occur after the close of probation. But there is a harvest that occurs before, correct? There would have to be if there's going to be Levites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, I, I really couldn't understand why people accepted his agricultural model as as even sensible, especially what it was doing to our lines. But that's a whole other point. The point is, we definitely can't just wait till after the close of probation to believe that there's some kind of harvest. We know that a harvest occurs beforehand. And it's not just that it's a different line even, um, though that's part of it. And, but how he was looking at these lines didn't really make any sense so that you can't have the priest Levites and Nethanims um, fitting into the type of line that he had for the for the harvest model. So you would have to have plowing for each of these. And uh, I'm not, it's just to me, it was just way too um, confusing for people. People were very confused by it. But anyway, maybe that was the purpose of it. But uh, the point here is that the former and the latter rain don't come in the first month. You have the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. They don't both don't occur at the same time. Correct? Or am I wrong on this? No, you'd be correct. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So it's just a misreading of this, this verse of what it's talking about. So God's going to have it come down moderately. Now, it's interesting just dealing with some of the studies that we did. Notice this word moderately, uh, the, which I'm just noticing is that the number is 6666. Now, how would that relate to what we're talking about here? Now, it's, it's based on the word righteousness. So I, I don't know why they translate it as moderately. Um, because it really is based upon the word that means righteousness. So it's only translated moderately in Joel 
but we see it here in in dealing with this because remember we just looked at that in judges <clears throat> So, so what is this telling us? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Why do they say that it's going to come down uh, righteously? <clears throat> Let's just look at that again, right? It says moderately, the former rain, moderately, but that's righteously. He will cause death to come down for you, the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. It did not connect to a waymark. Okay, so to a waymark, right? Because when we um, look at Isaiah 28, right? And it talks about <clears throat> uh, the plummet, right? And the line, right? Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So you can see that word righteousness is that same word. Sidah. Sidah. I don't know how you pronounce it. Sidah. Sidah. They say here. Sidah. Anyway. Um, so it's 6666 to the plummet. So righteousness would refer to a way mark on a line. I know we're taking our time here to think this through, but um, it's a very good point that Stephen brings up. And so when we look at judges, and we're going to deal with this sign of the fleece, It's, we're connecting it to the former rain. But is, is Gideon examining a message that has come previously, the former rain? Would this be us taking the history of this movement, what's happened since 1989 to 9-11, is that the first test, examining that history? Is this an examination of the foundation? An examination of a message. You relate to Millerite history. Okay, so we can relate it to Millerite history, right? So one of the things that we've done as Seventh-day Adventists is we take Millerite history as the former reign and that we have the latter reign that comes in connection with the Sunday law. So that would be on Ellen White's line, correct? The way that she, she sets up the line, right? The former reign is Millerite history. The latter reign is the Sunday law history. Now, we are in the Sunday law history because the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down at 9-11. But we would also have a, a former reign connected with our history as well, wouldn't we? Because we're paralleling Millerite history.
<clears throat> so one thing that we did, so after, um, and, and we started this actually on December 26th. So after December 25th, we started uh, a study on examining the foundation, right? Or is it this study we started? No, it was before that, right? We looked at that, I'm getting mixed up. So we first did a study of examining the foundation uh, in, uh, we started that study in, oh, I can't remember now. <laughs> Gonna have to look it up again. Um, <coughs> so we we looked at at examining the foundation uh, that began in uh, in March of twenty twenty one. So it would, um, yeah, I think it's March 7th. Okay. Now, why is that significant? Why, why were we examining the foundation? Is, is this what the first test is? Is the sign of the fleece an examination of the foundation of the message? Are we taking that as a sign to know that we can move forward? And if that's the case, what would the fleece represent? How would we, we take that and the ground being dry? I mean, I can just tell you what I think about all these things, but. <laughs> Any thoughts? Dwight? Listening. Okay. Yeah, because what's that? Continue, please. Okay, because I mean, to me, um, if we're looking at, at the message of July 18th, it's going to be after a certain point. The sign of the fleece must be after July 18th, and it has to be an examination of the message. It's not a particular test. I mean, it is a test. The test to see if the Holy Spirit has been leading us, right? But there's going to be the first test. The first test is this dew on the fleece itself. Now, the fleece is something that's cut off, right? It's cut off of the wool, right? And it's going to be set out and... And that to me would be an examination. Okay. Now, wait a minute. You said the fleece is cut off of the wool. Yeah. It's, it's the fleece of the wool that's cut off, right? It's the fleece of the wool. That's what's being talked about, right? So it's something that's cut off. It says fleece of the wool. Right? Okay. But the, the wool is cut off of the lamb. Yes, I know. But I'm just using, I'm just translating it literally. The cut off of the wool is what it would be literally in hebrew if we're going to put it into english all right right so the cut off of the wool that which is cut off which is of wool right so wool is cut off of a sheep okay and this fleece then is set out on the ground upon the earth on the floor and it's going to be examined. That is, there's the test put forward. And the dew, if it's on the fleece, then he knows um, that 
God is will save Israel by Gideon's hand. Okay, now I, I walked away for just a just a brief moment. Yeah. Did we establish what the sheep represent? Well, it doesn't really talk about the sheep. So it's I, not mentioned here as a symbol. I understand what you're saying. Um, but it doesn't mention sheep at all. It just mentions the fleece that's cut off, which obviously is cut off from a sheep. Right. So the, the question is, since the sheep is hidden okay. and not being addressed, is this is this wool, this fleece, something that is representative of coming from a true-hearted believer or a believer that needed to have proof? Okay. Um... Well, see, I, I take this sheep. The thing that's hidden is is Christ here, right? Okay. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And the fleece that's cut off is something that's a part of the body of Christ. So I'm, I'm not saying it, saying it refers to the worshipers themselves, but to a message, a remnant, right? It's the remnant message that's being examined. Has God been leading Adventists? Has God been leading this movement? And if that's the case, then there should be signs of the Holy Spirit upon the fleece. Okay. All right. So to me, that's what, what how I take this fleece test is it's an examination of the foundation of this message. And, and that foundation goes all the way back to Christ, to the cross, right? To the Because when we studied the foundation, we talked about um, how the rejection of July 18th was ultimately a rejection of the cross. Because all these disappointments, whether it's uh, our disappointment or the Millerites' disappointment or the disciples' disappointment, they're all based on the same principle. So that's how I'm taking the sign of the fleece is this, this is what the July 18th message does afterwards. Once these enemies are gathered around, now he sends out these messengers and now Gideon's going to examine, is God leading him? And that's what this movement has done, right? That's what we've been doing. So if that's the case, then when we look at the second test, um, so then Gideon's going to go through this again, but now he's going to reverse it. He says <clears throat> unto God, let not the anger be hot against me. I will speak, but this once, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. So would this represent the latter rain? It could. Okay. So in this case, why is there no dew upon the fleece, but there's dew upon the ground? Now, we notice also the doubling, but this once, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once, right? Okay. See, Jeff had connected this to those who didn't receive the lottery. In. Yeah. Okay. Right. But the ladder ring goes up on the ground here, but not up on the fleece. Can, can you explain a bit more how he applied this? I think it was applying to the two classes of worshipers. Okay. 
So there's a code Ellen White uses that the Larian could be flowing in hearts all around us. Mm -hmm. But uh, only there's those who do not recognize it or receive it. Okay. Yeah. So if we take the fleece here to also represent those that are cut off, right? Could it represent another message within this movement that doesn't have the latter rain? That doesn't have the Holy Spirit? Now, maybe, maybe these both represent the latter rain. You know, maybe we don't have one as the former and one as the latter. But the, the, the way that I'm looking at this is I'm seeing that we have, we're examining the message. So the first thing we do is we examine the foundation. Now, after we examine the foundation, we're then going to pick up a new study. Right? Which was? Um, so we finished, I'm just trying to find out exactly when we did this. So, um, so we picked up understanding the lines that began on December 26th. And we did the examining the foundation. So we did 187 studies. And that's going to go from March all the way to um, it's going to go all the way to. So we're going to do that one up until December. Uh, got to find the last one. Um, anyway, it's going to be, we're going to just follow. So we're going to finish that um, in December. I just don't know the exact date that we ended that study. All right, so um, I don't know if we did some little study in between there. That's what I'm trying to find out. But do you understand the point that I'm making here? That we move from one study, which is examining the foundation, to the next study, understanding the lines. And what is understanding the line showing us? Yeah, so we finished that on November 22nd, examining the foundation. So we're going to have um, another study in between there, which I, I can't remember which one it is, before we get to um, uh, the study of understanding the lines. So let me try to find out which one it was. Oh, the sanctuary from Eden lost to Eden restored. Okay. Um, I think that was that was just a Sabbath one or a Friday night one. So that wasn't the one. Um, can't remember what we did in between there from November 22nd. Oh, uh, we reviewed the 2520. That's what we did. I did uh, 
23 videos that I have on reviewing the 2520. So that's still part of examining the foundation in a way. Okay, so what so what's happening? If if I'm saying that up to December 25th, we're reviewing the foundation, and then on December 26th, we're working on understanding the lines. What's going to happen particularly at that point within the movement? So we know Colin presents on December 25th his understanding of Trump. We're going to have events that follow where uh, uh, the movement has a further division that occurs. So how would we fit this in with what we're looking at? Because I'm saying that this is an examination of something. So if we're examining first the former rain, and now we're examining the latter rain, what we see in the latter rain is that there is a group or a message that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit's being poured on on hearts all around them, right? And if we deal with this with this symbol, because we were saying that this was 9-11, right? 6-11. So if we go back, um, Judges 6-11, we said that Judges 6-11 represented 9-11, but it also represents November 11, 2019. And this is the 666 verse, 6,666 verse in the Bible, right? And we have this word that the former rain would be poured out moderately. So can we look at the former rain going from 1989 to 9-11? And that we're going to then pick up the latter rain from 9-11 onward. The first sprinklings of the latter rain occur. And that what we've been examining is understanding this, in understanding the lines, we're examining how this fits together. Anybody with thoughts on this? Because I feel like I'm just looking at this myself and I don't get a lot of other, whether other people are agreeing with it, whether they're seeing something else. But isn't it true after July 18th, we're going to be examining the message and we're going to see that there are two classes in this movement, that the movement is divided, right? That some of the fleece has the Holy Spirit, some of the fleece does not. Would we agree with that? Anybody disagree with what I'm saying? Does anybody agree with me? Or people undecided? Okay, William says yes. I'm not sure to which question. Does he agree or disagree? Be nice to have some verbalization here. Yeah, well, I'm sort of um, I'm listening and considering. Okay. But uh, do you have any ideas about what it could be? I mean, because I agree with Jeff. I mean that that this is about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says it's just the latter rain, right? That both are the same rain. But yes. or is he saying the second one is the latter rain? 
Well, my understanding was that uh, he was just relating them both to like being the latter Ian. Yeah, then that's the way I understood it of what he was saying. That we have the latter rain. But notice there are two different tests, two different times he sets this out. Right? So it's yes. not, not just one time. So there's two. And yeah, well, my my question would be, what would the ground be? What would they well, represent? The ground? Well, so, yeah, so that's why I say that the first one in when we have the Holy Spirit being poured out upon this movement at the beginning, right? It's just the movement that's receiving the Holy Spirit, right? But then we're going to have, and whether we understand this as former or latter rain, I don't know which is the best way to look at it. But when we look at, at what happens later, we know that the Holy Spirit is going to be falling on hearts all around us, right? So when I look at the ground, um, now, the word that's used there, the earth, is Eretz, which is uh, a reference often to the land of Israel, right? So it was dry upon all the earth. That means God's people hadn't received the latter rain. But, um, and they're going to use the word ground, it's still going to be Eretz, right? So dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground, let there be dew. So the ground here. It says there was dew on all the ground, Eretz. So, so that means that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out so that others will receive it. And this is what we understand regarding our message, is that's the purpose of the message. Now, when it's dry only upon the fleece, that means this fleece here that's represented are those that don't receive the latter rain. Does that make sense, Stephen? Yeah, so generally, Jeff applied it to the Sunday law. So you have the fleece mm -hmm. representing seven day witness. Yeah. We uh, yeah. first received the latter rain. And then that there's going to go to the ground in a sense. And those Adventists, the, um, there's going to be those Adventists who do not receive the latter rain and they're going to sort of be destitute in a sense of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, going to go to the ground. So the, the ground would be like other churches or... Yeah, other people that aren't Adventists. And, and I would agree with that. So I would agree that that represents then um, um, that bigger line, you know, from 1989 to the Sunday law. Right. But we're making an application of this to our movement. And, and to me, this must be an examination that occurs within the movement. Because remember, we're, we're taking this and we're applying judges in this particular way to, to this movement. And, and Gideon, particularly to the July 18, 2020 prediction, which wouldn't fit in um, with that, that interpretation of Jeff's, because that would not be, that wouldn't make sense. You couldn't have Gideon be uh, the message of July 18th, if you're going to take that interpretation of Jeff's and just apply that only. We would have to apply it to this movement then. So... The ones who don't have, have the do, the fleece that doesn't have the do, would have to represent the part of the movement that has rejected the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, this is was, pretty, pretty tough. Was stuff. not the water saved in the bowl? Yep. So the water saved in the bowl is the Holy Spirit that has been gathered together. So that's going to be uh, those that are studying and understanding and accepting the foundation of this message, right? So they're going to ring out this Holy Spirit, right? And it's going to be put in this bowl. So we would say that that's what this movement did prior to December 25th, 2021. That's what we've been doing. 
We've been studying God's word. We've been examining the foundation, the message, and particularly what we were looking at prior to December 25th, 2021, was examining the foundation of this message, both of Millerite history and also reading Jeff's papers, reading the newsletters, reading his notebook, right? And then we did this study on the 2520, which we learned a lot in that study of reviewing the 2520, understanding it better. And then on December 25th, Colin presents his study about Trump. And then on the 26th, we begin a new study, which is the study of um, understanding the lines. And in understanding the lines, there becomes a clearer separation in this movement. So we have two things happening. We're, we're, study, we're studying the lines, understanding the lines. Uh, but also, I, I shortly after that, begin a study on the presidents of the United States. And so we start to see this movement uh, becoming more clearly divided than it was before. So, so now we're taking something that Jeff had applied to Adventism at large, let's say, but we're applying it specifically to this movement. We're still using the same imagery and ideas, but it just becomes more narrowly focused. Is that reasonable? I mean, I know I got some people who agree with me, but I mean, Stephen brings up good points as well, right? So those are the things that we need to consider. We know how Jeff understood this but if we're applying it judges to our movement specifically then we would have to make an application of that to our movement so if we're <clears throat> we're applying this with judges as a message mm -hmm. then the fleece being wet and the fleece being dry are portions of that message itself right and parts of that message are has the holy spirit and part of that message doesn't or is it that all of the message has the Holy Spirit, and there's just some that are choosing to accept it and some that are choosing not to accept it. Yeah, well, yeah, so that, that's probably the better way to understand it. But this is also an examination of the message, right? That's the way I understand this, because this is a test. Right. Right. So I would say that if we're going to take the sign of the fleece, it's going to be set out on March 7th. 2021 the first first sign and then the second one's going to be set out on december 6th 2021 all right and now now march 7th 2021 what's the significance of march 7th 2021 all right so you said december 6th 2021 December 26th, 2021. 26th, okay, thank you. Yeah, December 26th. Yeah, so what's the significance of March 7th, 2021? Well, 1,700 years after the Sunday law. <laughs> okay, yes. So you picked up on that. Now, now at the time, I wasn't particularly thinking about any of that. Um, you know, we were just starting this new study. Okay. Now, um, so you got from 321, March 7th, 321 to March 7th, 2021. Or is it March 7th, 2020, I think? It's actually March 7th, 2020, not 2021. No, no, it's 2021. Boy, time's going by really quickly. Um, 
So on March 7th, 2021, this movement is going to begin examining the foundation. And, and that's going to be in connection with the symbol of the Sunday law. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Is it not? I think it's a major tie in. Okay. So we're going to, because we're putting these on a line very specifically, and we'll, we'll draw these out tomorrow. I'm actually going to draw them out in PowerPoint just so we have them kind of more permanent. So I'm saying that the, the laying out of the feet fleece begins on March 7th, 2021. Now, we're going to then beginning understanding the lines on December 26, 2021. And the significance of that is it just that it, it's the end of this um, period of 777 days. And the next day, we're going to be trying to understand the lines. So we're still in that study. So can we date these things in this very specific way? When we apply this to this movement, does it seem unreasonable to do this? No. Okay. So... So I hope that people are with me on this and people watching the video as well, that they can see what we're trying to say here. That now, now we know that Judges 6 then precedes Judges 7. And in Judges 7, we're going to now have this division of the 300 men. Now we know how Jeff applied the 300 men. He applied it to this movement after November 9th, 2019. Now, um, so can we now go and take ch Judges chapter 7 and have it to be a repeat and enlarge? Wouldn't we need to do this with, with Gideon's 300 men? That this isn't really future per se, though it, it encompasses more of a history than Jeff realized. I think it's only logical that we have to look at this as a, a repeat and enlarge. Okay. Yeah. So even though it follows the, the fleece, which we're now placing specifically in the time that we're in, when we take this Gideon 300 men and we look at the whittling down, we're going to go back and say that this is referring to this movement all the way back to 9-11 again. Right? So we're going to go back to 9-11 again. And is that where we should go back to if we're applying it to this movement? We're taking judges and going from 9-11 to 2023. Now, and, and that means that Gideon, in the, in the story of Gideon, chapter 6, we did go back to 9-11, even though we know that Gideon is, is November 9th, 2019, that we're marking him but we're connecting that to 9-11. And, and we can do that here with this as well. So that is, we can take chapter seven, and we know that there is this division that occurs between within this movement where we end up with the 300 when Parminder's group leaves. Not literally 300 people, but symbolically that. This, those that are still going to go ahead and give this message. And, and specifically, it's going to be the message of July 18th. So we saw that in Judges 6. So are we going to see the same thing in Judges 7? And we should be able to see it there. Okay, yeah. So we're not just going to follow and say that Judges 7 follows, you know, you know, the end of 2023, because remember, we're coming to the end of this, this 2023, and we already made chapter 
uh, six go to basically to 2023 because that's where it's going to end. So now Judges seven is just going to cover that same period. And, and we can see that there are differences here with, um, with Gideon. One of the differences is that this enemy is not an enemy that was left in the land, right? Though there is some enemy still in the land, but this is something that's going to come because of the Midianites, which is strife. And, and they're going to be the ones that are going to open the door for the children of the East and for the Amalekites to come. Right. And then there's going to be this false worship of Baal and so forth. So now when we look at this again, uh, then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. So they're going to be on the north side. And what's the north side represent? King of the north. Okay. So the king of the north, right? And so how would this, if we, if we go to November 9th, 2019, did we not mark that the victory of, I think it was the victory of the king of the south, right? Over the king of the north, right? So can, can, how can we reconcile this? What is the north side then referring to if it's talking about the king of the north? How did we understand north and south in relationship to uh, the messages? North paganism, south papal, or sorry, north papalism, south paganism. Okay. Now, do we see that um, Parminder's message represents the king of the north's message, papalism? I would have to agree with that. So, so are we then brought to that um, dividing line between what happened with the movement before and what happened with the movement after November 9th? We still have this strife. We still have this controversy. We still have this spirit that needs to be conquered in this movement. Agreed. And, and we know that Gideon, he rose up early here, pitch, pitched beside the well of Harad. Um, and the well of Harad um, is, I got to click on here because um, I can't remember now. Uh, the spring of Herod, right? Um, now, of course, Herod, the, you know, who we think of as Herod, he's not the one, he didn't live in this time. So his name is, is named after this. But it, Herod means um, that often this is the eye of Herod. So it, it's uh, when he says well there, that word is eye. I'm, and then Herod. So what is this referring to then? Uh, harad means to shudder with terror, hence fear. Well, Jeff had connected it to terrorism. To terrorism, okay. Yeah, so this, I mean, that would be one way of definitely to look at it, but it, it's the well of terrorism the well of fear. So they're going to pitch beside the well of fear so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mora. And Mora is, um, uh, means teacher uh, in the valley.
So then the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So we know they're whittled down for this reason that they would become self-sufficient, believing that they had conquered, right? Agreed. Okay. So God is bringing us through this experience of the whittling down uh, in connection with the July 18th, 2020 prediction, correct? Right. So we're going to see lots of people leave this movement as we, as Jeff picks it. So many people were with Jeff when he gets rid of Parminder, correct? We know that there's all kinds of people who are there really happy Parminder was gone. No. No, there was no people in this movement that ha were happy that Parminder was gone. There were those, but there wasn't a lot of people. Mo the majority of them stayed with Parminder. Oh, but I'm saying that were left over. Okay, those that were left over. So after November 9th, when Jeff presents it, we know that all that group had left already, right? When Jeff presents on September 7th, he's not, he's not, they're not even listening to Jeff's message, right? Because they're forbidden to listen to Jeff. Right. Okay. So the ones who hear Jeff, they're going to be rejoicing in what Jeff is saying, that Parminder was in error. So the, the WhatsApp is going to be very, very active. Now, when Jeff starts picking up July 18th, what's going to happen? With many of those who were happy about Parminder, Jeff talking against Parminder, what, what are they going to begin to do when it comes to um, July 18th? Are they going to support it? Well, first of all, there were some who were not happy with uh, November 9th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, th so they wanted Jeff to get rid of November 9th as well, right? So even, even before we get to July 18th, they just said, look, let's just get rid of everything that Parminder taught. We don't even want November 9th. But Jeff held on to November 9th, didn't he? Yes. Though, though he didn't accept what Tess said was going to happen on November 9th. So there was still people kind of happy with Jeff. Okay, they said, okay, he accepts that November 9th is significant, but none of the stuff that they said is going to happen is significant. Um, but that was a problem for some people because they couldn't understand why Jeff was holding on to November 9th to begin with. So why was Jeff holding on to November 9th still, even though he rejected what Tess said was going to happen on November 9th? Why did Jeff keep that? I mean, it could have been easy for Jeff just to say, well, Parminder was wrong and let's just move on. Let's just turn another page. Iran says, because it still marked the separation that was happening. So Jeff understood it was an internal way mark within this movement. And then it was also witnessed to chronologically. So Jeff understood Samuel Snow's letters. He understood how that history lined up with Samuel Snow's letters. He also understood that when he spoke on September 7th, not intentionally choosing that date, how it fit into this structure, so Jeff was able to recognize that when things occurred in this movement, it was based upon time. So he accepted November 9th as valid because otherwise he didn't have any, anything to stand on really against Parminder. I, I don't know if people can kind of see that. But Jeff, because Jeff had set it all up for Parminder. So Parminder now had this perfect 
way of taking over the movement. But the only thing that Jeff really had was the foundation that had been laid in the movement. And that foundation that had been laid in the movement, the movement had built upon it, and that was still solid. Just like personally, I was able to see that Parminder was in error. Um, and that's interesting. Iran has an interesting point there. So I was personally able to see that Parminder was in error because of when Jeff spoke his last sermon at Lambert Church. And this is the message where he speaks against Tess Lambert, right? So her last name being Lambert is important. And, but that's going to be the last message at Lambert Church. That's the division line. Anybody know what Lambert means? Anybody remember? Depends on your language, but if you're if you're looking at it in the Low German, out of the Old English, you would be looking at that as the light of the land or bright and famous. Yeah, the light of the land, right? So what's the significance then of that? <clears throat> that the Lambert Church was to be the light for the movement. Okay, so what does it mean when we end up with that um, last um, sermon at Lambert Church? You mean where, <clears throat> where Elder Jeff is exposing Tess Lambert? Yeah. That the light is exposing the false light? Okay. So we have the true light and the false light. Right. There's probably more to it than that as well, but, but that's the basic idea. Now, just to sort of finish off here, because we only got a few minutes, I do want to look at what Iran just presented. So when we look at this separation, right? Judges 7-2, the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying mine own hand has saved me. Now, July 2nd is the middle day of the year in a 365 day year. <laughs> now this verse is also the 187th verse in the book of Judges, right? Yep. Okay, so you have the 187th verse, and, and it also symbolizes July 2nd, the middle day of the year. So what would be the significance then of this verse, of these symbols attached to this verse? And what's being said in the verse? Why, why is this significant? I mean, we obviously know that uh, the message of Gideon is about July 18th. So we have the 187th verse here. And we know that this section with the blowing of the trumpet is going to end on July 18th as a symbol, right? So that's why one of the reasons why this has to be in, repeat and enlarge, because we take this as the message of July 18th, this blowing of the trumpet this message of warning. 
So is the message being whittled down from when Jeff stands up on September 7th, 2019, speaks against Tess, and then we begin this whittling down process? And, and we're going to see it happen. I mean, it happens through that period of time, doesn't it? I would have to ask if whittling down is not <clears throat> a uh, a poor choice of words. Okay. Well, I, what I don't. if what if this is a distillation of the message? Okay, a distillation, so that this isn't necessarily about the people themselves, but an understanding of the message, what it symbolizes. Right. Okay. That could be a good point that we looked at it as the people themselves. But the message itself is, is something that needed to be refined, especially in the, the situation that had occurred with Parminder and Tess, because it, there's so much confusion as to what was going on. And then Elder Jeff came out and was giving us a more direct message, but we need really a a purity of this to be able to go forward with it yeah well and i also look at it as a focusing of everything that jeff had ever taught because jeff right. to see those lines all come together that's why he could make the statement that july 18th everything that i've ever taught points to july 18th 2020 right so he understood what he had taught and he understood how everything led to this point. And so he knew that if he rejected July 18, 2020, he'd have to reject his whole message. So it becomes a focusing of the message. And so for Jeff, this really symbolized also the people who were going to give that message. And in, in, in a sense, you can't separate the message from the people. They, they are tied together. But um, I, so I, I see your point, and your point is a really good one. So we're going to have to pick this up tomorrow morning, though. So everybody keep thinking about these things, keep studying them, and we will now close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so very grateful again for uh, these studies. We know this one has been a difficult study, and uh, we need to think about these things more closely. We just ask, Lord, that you can help us as we continue sorting through the lines and how they relate to the story of Gideon. So be with each one today. May your angels watch over us. May you guide and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.